Maranello, Italy. A city dedicated to motor racing and the fabulous Ferrari factory. A place of national pride where everything is dominated by the symbol of the prancing horse. This emblem is equated with excellence and adorns some of the rarest and most beautiful automobiles of the 20th century. The prancing horse was the hallmark of a great genius. The late Enzo Ferrari. From the very first to the present, all Ferrari automobiles were race bred. For almost half a century, the racing cars of Enzo Ferrari have challenged the world, winning fame and fortune. Mr. Ferrari drew his drivers from the ranks of international champions of Italy, Argentina, America, Austria, Canada, France, and Great Britain. British drivers have long served Ferrari well. The latest to join the great Mark Ferrari is the British champion, Nigel Mansell. Mansell arrived at Ferrari with something of a reputation. Enzo Ferrari was a connoisseur of driver talent. He sought drivers who had heart, a quality Mr. Ferrari prized above anything. Heart meant fighting spirit, the ability to seize a racing car by the scruff of its neck and win. Nigel Mansell was seen as such a driver. He was the last driver to be personally chosen by Enzo Ferrari before his death in 1988. He said that he admired my type of driving and that uh, there was no question that uh, when I was in the car he could see that I gave my best. You know, I was privileged because I had a, a nice lunch together with him uh, in the middle of the circuit at uh, Maranello. And it was really from then that, you know, he said he wanted me to drive for Ferrari, but um, unfortunately at that time we didn't get it together, so to speak, and, uh, but now I'm, here I am, very much a Ferrari driver. The British driver would do more than justify his hopes. Within weeks of Mr. Ferrari's death, Mansell led the team to victory. Mansell regarded his initial time at Ferrari as one of consolidation for both parties. Above all, he looked to a car and engine and the backup to take him to World Championship honors. 1989 was both a trying and a mixed season for Scuderia Ferrari. Mansell won. He placed. He persevered. Despite a lurid accident to his teammate Berger due to a defective car, a fault which might have occurred on his own vehicle. He fought with inspired determination. He made motoring history in a sensational duel with Brazilian ace Ayrton Senna. Demonstrations of brilliance which won him international acclaim. But not the World Championship. 1990 marked Mansell's second year with Ferrari and the renewal of his quest to become World Champion. His hopes will rest in the ultra-secret racing department where no film camera has ever been before. Let me hear it. 
I've had negotiations at length with Ferrari and for the film crew to be with me here today and, and to be able to film the car as closely as we are and have a look at all the machinery is, um, is quite extraordinary. I mean, I think in recent years has never been done. I think in the past has never been done like we're doing it. This is what we call the Virgin Office. Uh, the steering wheel we have here, which is revolutionary because of, uh, obviously, the gear shift. Um, needless to say, no one's seen this as close up as we're uh, having a look at it now. Basically, this is how you change gear. Three, four, five, six, seven. That's what you do to get up into top gear. And then coming down, six, five, four, three, two, one. And to uh, bolt this and make it part of the car is you have a sp spring-loaded catch here. And you push it on, click it back, and there you have a steering wheel on the car. You can see how stiff it is to get it off. You can see sort of very little room in the cockpit. And you can see how narrow it is here. And I'm one of the largest Grand Prix drivers currently uh, racing. Um, certainly, broadness-wise, I think Derek Warwick and myself are uh, probably the hev heaviest as well. I'm sorry, Derek, but <laughs> I've got to bring you into it as well. Um, and therefore, my shoulders, I almost have to sort of bend my shoulders round a little bit and bow them because I can't actually sit flat back with my shoulders out square. This is the standard floor level. You can see that where we're actually sitting, when the, where the ruler is, there's a depression. And this depression to the underneath of the car is probably less than probably about four or five millimeter. And therefore, and we do that so we can get lower in the car. And the reason we do that again is that we have the air intake here for the engine. And if our helmet comes above this level, then obviously we're restricting the air intake to the car and uh, obviously taking away potential performance to the engine. This, this lever here, which is on already, is, is the uh, adjustable roll bar. Um, you've obviously got five settings. That's in the full soft position. And if the roll bar is connected, which it isn't, um, it actually moves two blades, or one blade, de depending on the configuration of, of the anti-roll bar. It's essential that we have a rev limiter on the engine because um, otherwise, uh, needless to say, if you do pull the wrong gear or go the wrong way on the steering, uh, which I haven't showed you, one of the hardest things on this particular gear change is that when you're on full lock, the steering wheel is upside down. So your up change is opposite uh, to the down change. So if you're going around the corner at the same time um, and you pull the wrong gear, all of a sudden you're in trouble. Would Nigel be permitted to tell us about the radical electric gearbox? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll touch on this. I can't go too specifically, otherwise I'll find I'll get the sack at the end of the year. <laughs> but, I mean, these are very special parts here uh, because through these solenoids, these actually change the gears for you. It sends a signal, and the gearbox, obviously, is from here back. You can see that it's very compact. It's, uh, it's quite light. And um, if there is going to be an advantage, we're going to have it this year in 1990. What we have here, um, from the floor up to the top here, to there, and extending past the driver to about here, this is all the fuel tank. And this constitutes, as you can see, probably a good third of the car of the monocoque. There's four things I always do when I get into a car, and the four things I check are the four things that can kill you. And basically, if your steering goes wrong, you're in big problems. If your brakes go wrong, you're in big problems. And if a wheel falls off, and if uh, the aerodynamic package, that is front wing, rear wing. Suspension can break and other things can go wrong and it can cause an accident, but sometimes you've got time to control it. But I think the biggest thing that I know everybody will relate to is the accident Gerhard Berger had, my teammate, in 1989. And it was just a simple thing that went wrong with the aerodynamic uh, uh, package at the front, which was the front wing, and he understeered straight off the, uh, the circuit. I think the thing that excites me more than anything in Formula One is just winning. I mean, just being there, competing, winning, and I think now this is probably the most exciting time in my life, being with Ferrari. A traditional event at Ferrari is the yearly press conference where the new contender for Grand Prix honours makes its debut.
the 641 Ferrari Grand Prix car is polished to perfection. Even its tires gleam. The press of Italy are out in force. No angle of the car is unrecorded. Everyone crowds in for a better look. The drivers make their appearance. First the world's champion, Alain Prost. Then the British champion, Nigel Mansell. Followed by Morbidelli, a cadet driver for the Ferrari team. Excitement moves to hysteria. Cameramen work themselves into a frenzy, pushing and jostling each other for the best position. And the whole ritual is repeated again in the conference center. The chairman of Ferrari addresses distinguished members of the press. Explanations of the past season are given. Hopes for the new season are raised. Mansell struggles with simultaneous translation. Distinguished guests arrive late. Shortly, the satisfied press would go to lunch, while Nigel Mansell would fulfill a different appetite. At the private Ferrari test track, driving the 641 in anger for the first time. Prior to extensive tests in Portugal with Prost. The 12 cylinder engine snarls as Mansell accelerates away with apparent disregard for the wet circuit. His lightning fast gear changes sound like music in the winter air. The 1990 season was to begin with Phoenix, USA, a race that Ferrari would probably like to forget. Three seized engines in practice, and an electrical gearbox failure during the race would give Mansell a terrible turn. And now we're back with a Ferrari because this is Nigel Mansell. Nigel Mansell has been working his way up to fifth place, and we've had some smoke from the back of the number two Ferrari as well. And we've got a lot of smoke, we've got fire, that's the end of Nigel Mansell's race. Brazil, where he won last year, was no better. Mansell had flu. The 641 had uncertain handling. Race leader Ayrton Senna and a back marker collided, giving Alain Prost a fortunate win. His first for Ferrari. It was an emotional moment for the world champion and the Ferrari team manager, Cesare Fiori. Imola was to prove a Mansell classic. In front of the home crowd, the car and driver were on four. Mansell was in a very strong position behind the McLarens. He closed on his ex-teammate, Berger. What follows is heart-stopping. Berger, by accident or design, runs Mansell off the track resulting in a colossal spin by the Ferrari, twice round at 195 miles per hour. Showing exceptional car control, Mansell recovers, but vengeance was not to be, as the Ferrari engine had had enough. Another blow to Mansell. The Grand Prix of Monaco looked distinctly unpromising. If great cities of Europe qualify by charm, the Principality of Monaco has no rivals. Suave, urbane, and decidedly Grand Lux, it remains a bastion of wealth and the site of the most glamorous Grand Prix in existence. 
Since the earliest days of the sport, the greatest drivers and machines of the day have raced on the public streets and avenues of Monte Carlo. Victory here was to win the most prestigious race of all. From the starting grid, the first corner is saint devot which, viewed from a low-slung racing car, is blind, a daunting feature in itself. Then up the hill, Monte du Beau Rivage, a nice jaunt at 170 miles an hour. Flick through a subtle curve to confront Monte Carlo's famous casino. No time to bless your bats, but break hard outside the Hotel de Paris to a modest 120 miles per hour. On these very roads, the grandest names of motorsport roared. Bugatti, Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Mercedes-Benz, Auto Union. Downhill now into Mirabeau, where master drivers can gain fractions of seconds, and the young Turks of racing can make or mar a reputation. Into station hairpin, then Virage du Portier, Another blind curve, and one that leads to the incredible tunnel, a unique feature of the course. Nigel Mansell recalls hitting the barriers on both sides of the tunnel, ricocheting his way out to emerge in one piece and to carry on driving. Down the waterfront, on the exact road where Nuvolari and Barzi fought like wild beasts for supremacy. Here, Ascari crashed his lancia into the harbour. There died brave Bandini in terrible flames. On this circuit, the great Sterling Moss routed the entire Ferrari team with his underpowered and agile Lotus. Others would win laurels driving in the wet. Who could forget the victories of Beltois, Lauda, Prost, or the five times winner of Monaco, Graham Hill? The Rascas, a corner where the world champion Jack Brabham was passed and a new star, Jochen Rint, was created. Monaco is a kingmaker, beautiful, demanding, and very, very dangerous. Uh, Monaco, historically for me, it's not been one of the best places. I love the place, but in terms of actually finishing races here and having mechanical reliability is, I think I've only ever finished one race in 10 years. Day one begins with Nigel arriving outside the Ferrari caravan on a scooter, practically in disguise, to avoid detection by the fans. He is wished good morning, Italian style. Ciao. Greetings and formalities over, he sits down to a breakfast of champions. Now what we have here is uh, we have raw grated carrot, parmesan cheese and just plain bread. And um, it looks like the rabbit's been at the bread too. But um, that's what you get when you drive for Ferrari. The, the, the actual carrot is good for the stomach, for the acids, etc. Parmesan is very good and I can't tell you what it's good for. <laughs> It's good for energy, and oh yes, you obviously know. And um, obviously, the bread is just filling, but uh, no butters, no fats as such. The parmesan, um, although it's got some fat in, it's not like the normal fatty cheese. I think the only thing that I'm a little bit annoyed about this morning is the fact that I've been ill most of the night. I hate that. Breakfast over, he reports to his own personal doctor, uh, yeah, who yeah. attends his every need. This is the uh, the new driver of the team. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The only trouble is, is that he's sometimes one of the best in the world. <laughs> Never mind it. You're right. Mansell's quarters in the yeah. motorhome are I cramped, almost submarine-like. Here, he will spend a great deal of his time. One set of OMP 
racing overalls which are very very good in fact they are the early ones so we'll I think today we'll, we'll wear a new set might bring us a little bit more luck a pair of uh, fireproof underwear there's a set of um, tops to go with that but I'm afraid it's my prerogative I use a, a Marlboro sweatshirt underneath Then we have um, the Baraclava, which uh, we can wear. All these are, are new. I'll use that one today. I like the ones with the spy holes because uh, I know you just feel you have a little bit more protection. And, and this hole here, which is cut especially for the drink, so you got your, you got your two eyes here. And also, if you have a hole cut here, you can breathe just a little bit better. This is um, my helmet I used at uh, the last race, which has been cleaned a little bit, but not totally. You can see the visor's still old of, uh, of Imola, but uh, that helmet is probably uh, okay to use this weekend. Soon, the hour to go to work arrives. Mansell is at the pits. His car is not ready, being still in transit from the garage. His task is complex, to tune and adjust his own machine on two sets of tyres. Short-life qualifying tyres for maximum grip. Race tyres for long distance. Mansell has 36 sets of tyres to choose from. He will also set up the spare car, or muletto for use by himself or his teammate Prost in the event of an emergency. This is a decided advantage for the team. The Ferrari drivers share the task, changing responsibility from race to race. Nigel sets out to be first on the track to practice. A very strong psychological ploy. A clear track, a clear mind, and maybe he will make the pace. <laughs> the qualifying tires demand warmth to work at their very best. They have a very limited life, three laps. The Ferrari shows its form. Quick, very quick. Having given the competition something to think about, he changes cars to the muletto. The muletto, or mule, isn't quite the old hack it sounds. The engine has a more radical power band and a few demon tweaks on the rear airfoil. Mansell's personal engineer will log suspension settings, tire pressures, temperatures and ride heights. Ten years a Grand Prix driver, Nigel Mansell's expertise is invaluable. Out on the track again. There's more traffic now. Other teams are starting to show their form. Mansell reveals more speed still. Anxious eyes study the computer as the British driver starts his hunt for vital seconds. In the first hour, Mansell is fastest. In again. Hopes are raised for Scuderia Ferrari. But another presence on the track has everyone's attention. Ayrton Senna. The Brazilian driver, Mansell's arch-rival, betters the Ferrari times. 
as does his teammate Berger. They in turn fall to Jean Alesi, the Tyrrell driver whose car and Pirelli tyres are well matched. Mansell is set to reply, only to have a near disaster. The electronic gearbox locks up at Casino, causing him to slide over a curb and break his front wing. This is a recurrent failure of last season, supposedly cured. Then he remembers Phoenix. His confidence fails. The afternoon finds the 641 having a change of spark plugs. Further practice sees the Ferrari gearboxes under closest inspection. These top secret parts are muffled away from the prying eyes of rival teams and curious spectators. In the light of the morning's incident, Mansell decides not to attempt anything extreme. Instead, he banks a safe and rapid lap, assuring him an excellent position on the final grid. Perhaps he intends to save the fireworks for race day. He is quizzed by a relentless press. Mansell steers the diplomatic course. So what are the highlights? The highlights when I go home now. We've done a lot of good work. I think for the race we're in good shape. I mean, the important thing is, is uh, we know we can go much faster. So the the um, restriction in our time today has been a physical one of, of not being able to have a free lap. Um, it would be much more disappointing if the car wasn't able to go quicker, but we know the car can go much quicker, so um, uh, come Saturday it'll be a lot better. But, I mean, you're probably seeing, which is perfect for this program, uh, a typical real mix-up of a day in, in Formula One terms. I mean, it's a big casino and uh, we, um, we had more probably than our fair share of uh, inconveniences. For the first hour, I felt that you were really beginning to... to yeah, I mean, loop. you know, we were, we were quickest for the first hour for, for a long, long time, but I was having three laps and uh, I wasn't having traffic problems and uh, we were making progress on the car. And then all of a sudden, bingo, I mean, no more free laps, no more progress, frustration, and you just don't get the job done then. So what, what are you going to on tomorrow? Uh, play golf. Rest day. While drivers rested, teams labored. McLaren are the prime source of speculation. Senna is rumored to have 40 extra horsepower from his Honda engine. Other teams wonder how to cope. Everyone strips and checks their equipment, seeking the slightest advantage. Especially strong is the Tyrrell team. Morale has soared with the performance of Jean Elese, the dark horse of the race. Hanging in there, Brabham's look for better luck. Strong contenders team Williams relies on Sooty instead. Who knows what power lies in Cosworth or Lamborghini? In the Ferrari camp, there is calm and order. Has Prost shown his hand? And what of Mansell? Well, man, this is what it's all about. There's no phones, no people. He can relax. I saw your face, but I thought, is he, is, he going to, is he going to warn him? And I thought, no, and I thought, I thought, I thought stop it, I'm not going to warn him. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can do a, a decent shot. Well, it got out. That's about it. <clears throat> Early days yet, man. Early days yet. Days <clears throat> Show you a trick I did in Japan a couple of years back with the 
the managing director of uh, Canon, and uh, he was not impressed with me at all, as probably you guys uh, are finding out fast. Right, there we go. So by the time we got to the 18th, I mean, I was really ticked off. So I said to the managing director, I said, uh, how can I bowl your ball? And on the 18th hole, we had to wait because there's people in front. There's a big, big river you had to drive across. I said, you ever seen this trick? So I got his ball, and I put his ball on the bottom, and I put my ball on the top. Notice the helmet design. And what you do, you see, you just take a nice little swing at the shot, like that, and you catch the ball, and you go, there you go, and he's, hey! and he's got two henchmen with him, and, uh, you know, and I say the moral to the story is, is, I'm not stupid because this is my ball, and your ball's just gone in the river. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> oh, well, pleased with that. Not a man. That surprised you, didn't it? No retakes. Tell you what, I'll let you into a little secret. Surprised me too. <laughs> and look at that for a magnificent view. I mean, that is just exceptional. I mean, you can see the hotel where we stay. You can see the Lowe's Hotel, and you can see the tunnel. Uh, you can see most of the racetrack, actually. You can um, see coming into Casino Square, Hotel de Paris. And, of course, <clears throat> if we zoom in, you can see all the, um, all the marina down there, where the boats are, the harbour. And, of course, where the motorhomes and the, the pits are. But that is exceptional. But, I mean, that is gorgeous. It really is. And the swimming pool area down there... The actual area just down there, if you can zoom in right down to the beach, you could probably even see my, my family, because they're on that swimming pool just down there, the round one. I think the marvellous thing is uh, when you're up here on a day like today, and in between practices, I mean, obviously yesterday and qualifying again tomorrow, is that um, it's all a little bit unreal, because, I mean, looking down here and playing golf, Nothing really matters. I mean, it's very, very calm and, and quiet. There's no noise. I mean, look at the different things that are going on. You can really appreciate uh, a lot of life in the world. Well, see how, how high you can jump. Summer's light lingers on. The Monaco Grand Prix dons glittering gowns. Center of attraction is a gala dinner, hosted by the major sponsor. Style. Prestige. Glamour. Beautiful cars and beautiful people. Drivers and important personalities mingle with their ladies, dressed in the latest mode. A kind of glorious dream come true. The Mansells are on show, taking it all in their stride. I don't know.
exchanging greetings. Making pleasantries. <laughs> Becoming part of the dazzling parade. Solitary Senna appears like a lone wolf. For a few seconds, he and his teammate Berger stand together and then apart. Tension exists between the McLaren drivers. Team managers and all their drivers are presented on stage. Few of them would stay to eat the four course dinner. Practice was just hours away. Saturday practice. The teams assemble with fresh cars. Paramedical units of volunteers take their posts. As do the disciples of Ayrton Senna. A determined Nigel Mansell leaves his motor home to go to the pits. A journey as perilous as the race to come. On and on the fans come. There seems to be no end to them. To watch Mansell in progress is to see one of his secrets. From such relentless public attention, he seems to draw a kind of energy. Charging himself to full power for the task ahead. are Mansell's mechanics, warming up the engine, putting the electric gearbox through its paces. The press gate. Tired technicians exchange views. The Ferrari doctor puts a few finishing touches to his driver. Mansell exudes determination. He and Alain Prost are to mount a major attack on the opposition. The 641 is on near empty fuel tanks. To make it lighter, it's set for maximum performance. Until the dying minutes of the session, they will rule the roost. And then, a lazy goes fastest, only to be eclipsed by Senna. A searing lap, one minute and 21 seconds. The pilots 
blow on their fingers. The old champions marvel at the young. And everyone goes to lunch. The Ferrari mechanics eat pasta and drink Lambrusco. Even the Camel Lotus team takes a break. Everyone ponders the final session yet to begin. The action is fast and furious. To the eye that is quick, at La Rascas corner, the Goodyear shot car seem less sure than a lazy on his sticky qualifying Pirelli tires. Berger astonishes the spectators and himself by trying a new line around the corner, mere inches from catastrophe. His teammate Senna is in perfect balance, serene and assured. Mansell is seventh fastest, but he is not discontent. Does he foresee something others don't? I'll predict something here now. That uh, tomorrow will be a big casino at the front because with uh, Ayrton, Alan and Alacy, and Alacy especially wanting to prove something on this circuit, uh, if there isn't a bit of barging and maybe even a coming together at the first corner or on the first lap, I'll be very surprised. We had a good clear lap this afternoon and we changed the setting to try and improve the traction of the car. And uh, we should have gone a little bit faster really, but I have two problems. One, um, I've got a little uh, lack of confidence in whether it's going in gear or not at the precise time that I want it. So I'm holding back a little bit, giving a little bit of a margin. And the qualifying tyre for me, I still can't get to work as good as I should which is probably my problem, not the tyres problem. I can't warm it up quick enough to get the best out of it. So all in all, really, uh, I mean, I'll say this looking at you in the eye, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to be where I am on the grid because uh, it's been a tough weekend up until now. Another session with the press, no, no, this time no, no, in no. Pigeon English. Full, full gear and there's no gear. No. Race day. The early morning of race day is cloudy with the threat of rain. At first light, people have started to pour into Monaco, from France and neighbouring Italy, to see the spectacle. Expectations are high this year. There are seven likely winners. Senna, Prost, Berger, Patrese, Butzen, Alesi and Mansell. All these leading drivers are within two seconds of the best time anything can happen and probably will the pits are strangely still everything seems to be waiting in anticipation dominant are the stacks of tires mute contestants in Grand Prix wars Teams attend to last details. Not yet. Some practice tyre changing drills. Others marvel at the gathering crowd or take up their positions for the race. And all the while, the tension, slowly and inexorably, begins to mount. And I'm full tank with this setting, which is the rear right hand. Maybe on the tea car, then try uh, the setting uh, yesterday, yeah, Eric. This is uh, <coughs> my engineer, Mirzi Anardan, who uh, I might say is uh, <coughs> the best engineer I've had today. <laughs> Almost the only engineer, let's say. <laughs> and now. An hour before the start, the calm before the storm, the champion sleeps. A chance to dream. The 
entry of the gladiators. Polite applause for Prost. Thunderous acclaim for Mansell. warm-up lap to start position. Mansell and his Ferrari are alone. The seconds become centuries. Everything strains for release. Up to Casino, past the Hotel du Paris. Gerhard Berger is impetuous. Too soon, he collides with Prost. Chaos follows. Anticlimax as Mansell returns to the grid. His predictions have come true. Berger and Alesi, over eager, have caused a not so minor shunt on the Mirabeau corner of the first lap. A restart is called for. Prost has to switch cards. His own, nearly as fast as Senna's, has been too badly damaged by Berger. He must use the mule. Nigel is briefed as to the accident. He entertains us with his version. Alain consults his teammate as to how many gears forward it has. Prost prefers six. Mansell, like seven. Prost departs to race in a strange vehicle with an extra gear, which may alter his technique. It's a brave action. Prost's rivals lick their lips in hope that he's become an easy prey. Around the course once more, on a warm-up lap. Back to the starting grid for the second time. The lights are on. The race begins. Senna leads the pack. Prost tentative with the new Ferrari. McLaren and Ferrari separated by two seconds. Berger pushes hard. On the second lap, the gap is four seconds. Alesi and Berger, the Williams, a Monardi, then Mansell. Mansell closes on Williams driver Lutzen. Senna leads Post by eight seconds. Lap 15. Mansell attacks Bootsen, the Belgian giving no ground. Then Nigel comes into the pits. His nose cone is broken from contact with Bootson's rear wheels. Repairs and a change of tyres is called for.
He rejoins the race in 16th place, a lap down. Prost into the pits. His perfectly healthy Ferrari has fallen to electric problems. A miserable end to a fine second place. Mansell is going like the wind. He catches Boutin up once more. He hounds the Belgian driver. By lap 45, the Ferrari is in fifth place and close to fourth, a superb effort. The race has suddenly become intense with possibility. The crowd goes mad. The Ferrari is waved on. And then, Mansell 641 stops. The battery has expired, just as it did with Prost. He suffers the long walk back through the pits. His face, a mask of fatigue and depression. Once more, he has driven a race full of resolution. For Ferrari, it was a sorry day. After so much promise, Bootsen is like this. Like his death. Oh. Crazy. Nigel, it's all right, Bevel. Okay, I... But you did a very good race, because after, after the accident, you had a very... Uh, I yeah, pushed very hard. A lot of, a lot of people. No, no, I know. I pushed very hard. I, I won points. I want to finish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, we have to wait now to Canada. I'm sorry, huh? Because uh, mm -hmm. I want to finish. I want You're to sorry. Finish we, we're sorry for sorry. you. Okay, man. Well, basically, we've done a film of the whole Monaco Grand Prix, and uh, you've seen me now, minutes after I've got out of the car. Um, what can I say except uh, you can judge for yourself about the race. We had, obviously, an interesting one. And yet again, a very disappointing one. And, uh, we had a technical problem with the car, which uh, lost me the gears. It was an electricity problem, which probably uh, came from a flat battery, believe it or not. Um, what can one say except very disappointed? I believe everybody enjoyed the race. Um, you know, we're just going to wait until the next one. I'm afraid this is the job I do, and uh, you probably see me now a little bit disappointed. <laughs> On the Isle of Man, a week later, Nigel, in the comfort of his own living room, was rested and ready for Canada and Mexico. What were his thoughts and feelings? Very mixed feelings, mixed emotions, mainly because uh, I've had certainly, although hectic, for the last 36, 48 hours being in your home and you've had your family around you and your children. Um, it's a wrench to go away, especially when you know it's going to be a three-week trip and incorporating two races transatlantic. Um, and obviously I'm probably a little bit more um, dubious as opposed to excited because of all the mechanical failures that we've had up until now. You know, what's gone past is, is history. I mean, you always look forward to the future. And um, the, next, um, the next few uh, weeks are going to be very, very hard on the road. I mean, mainly because... Um, we don't know what's around the corner because of the problems we've had reliability. Canada's a tough circuit, Mexico's even tougher. Um, if I come back with what I hope, sort of a minimum of sort of 15 points in the bag, and I'll come back a very happy man, I'll be very, very positive. As good as his word, Mansell came close to fulfilling his desire in Canada. After besting his teammate Prost, Mansell appeared in the points. A fine third place. He even managed a handshake with his rivals Piquet and Senna. How would he do in Mexico? The answer would be, quite nicely, thank you. Mexico would prove a brilliant spectacle of Grand Prix racing. A drama where all the elite drivers would star and the outcome would be continually in doubt. For the opening laps, the McLarens made the pace. Senna in his favorite position, out front. Berger behind, watching his flank. Behind them, 
a jostling, snarling pack, with Team Williams looking strong. Prost and Mansell are in deep concentration at the moment, as yet to show their hand. Prost jousts with Mansell's old sparring partner, Bootsen. He applies relentless pressure to the Belgian. Senna is majestic and serene. The Ferraris were quicker in practice. When will the challenge come? His teammate Berger is in for tyres. Now, it's a battle between the two Ferrari teammates. A fascinating struggle, as the cars are set to individual preference. Prost's car has less wing. Mansell's car is tuned for grip. Prost takes advantage of Mansell's position in traffic. An elegant move. He breaks away in a tremendous burst of speed. The Ferraris start to close on the leading McLaren. Prost into the attack. Senna makes him work for every inch of the road. Prost comes to overtake, but not without a battle. Mansell swiftly follows suit. Senna's right rear tyre collapses from a slow leak. His race is rough. While closing on Frost, Nigel spins on a dirty track. To rejoin the race, unaware that Gerhard Berger has closed within range. Nigel Mansell is now in his sights. Berger covers him. A look in the mirror. He knows he must escape. To take liberty, the view in Berger's mirrors is the blood red of the Ferrari. Red is the mist over Mansell's eyes as he does the incredible, an impossible maneuver flat out on the outside of the astonished Berger. Magnificent. Awesome. A masterpiece of driving. Victory for Prost. Glory for Mansell and Ferrari. Scuderia Ferrari, first and second. A triumph for the team and for fans everywhere. No matter how fortune and fate would treat Nigel Mansell, his greatest drives with Ferrari will long be remembered. Shining examples of extraordinary courage linked with tremendous skill. The summit of the driver's art. <laughs>